Welcome back to the Frank Roach Show. It's Thursday, April 11th. Great to have you with me. Got some subscriber growth happening. Little itty bitty subscriber growth, but I appreciate it. If you're listening today and haven't subscribed, please do. Like the video. Tell your friends and family to do the same. I appreciate the support. More inflation data came out for the U.S. economy today. The producer price index for the month of March was released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS.gov. If you want to check the data yourself, the producer price index was up 0.2% in March, year over year up 2.1%, a little higher than expected. Final demand for goods was down 0.1%, and final demand for services was up 0.3%. When we look at less food and energy, so the core PPI, again, taking out those volatile series of food and energy, driven by speculation on international financial markets, the index was up 2.8% year over year. And so more inflationary pressures on the producer side. Oftentimes when prices go up for producers, they pass them out to consumers. Now, the peculiar thing about this report, and again, I, I hate doing this, but I think we're seeing more gaslighting here, more manipulation of data. It's anecdotal at the moment. I'll come back to you with some later podcasts to see if, if see if my assessment is correct. But final demand for goods down 0.1%. Now, how do we get to down 0.1% for final demand for goods? Well, the BLS claims that on a seasonally adjusted basis, final demand for energy in the month of March fell 1.6%. And I'm sorry, that does not seem to be the case. You tell me, you're a listener, you, you, you buy gas, you heat your homes. You tell me if that makes sense. I think the data reveals gasoline at the retail level over the month of March, I think is about 45 or 5%. And so seasonal adjustments, which is a common thing to do with data. We think of seasonalities, we think of summer when it comes to vacation. Seasonalities affect Christmas. Seasonalities affect July 4th. Seasonalities affect the transition, transmission from fall to winter and winter to spring. But something seems a little bit aggressive here. How the final demand for energy fell 1.6% when it's very obvious that gasoline at the retail level was up close to 4 or 5 or 6% is anyone's guess. But what this does is, again, when it comes to Fed policy and what they'll do with interest rates, again, if you're an investor, a trader, a personal finance manager, or someone who owns a home, wants to buy a home, manages their own finances, we need to know what the Fed's going to do with interest rates. And this is further confirmation the Fed will be on hold in June. Interest rates remain unchanged. The federal funds rate right now is 5.25% to 5.5% is the range. The effective rate is about 5.33%. And that's not going to change in the April May meeting or in the June meeting. After two days of indications that inflation is actually picking back up. Remember now, inflation is the rate of change in the price index. A price index is composed of a typical basket of goods and services consumed by the producer or, for that matter, from yesterday's podcast, from the consumer. And both indices are rising faster than they were a couple months ago. So not good news there. And more of the same, the Fed's on hold for sure in June. I usually can like came across the Wires today, the wires, the internet, the wires. That's funny. Hey, old man. About the Biden administration threatening Iran if they attack Israel. Remember a couple weeks ago, Israel attacked the Iranian Revolutionary Guard offices in Damascus, Syria, took out several people, including top level generals. The next day, they hit more Iranian Revolutionary Guard slash Hamas officials in Gaza. The Ayatollah has threatened a reaction, a response for Israel's actions. And apparently through back channels, not President Biden, mind you, but through back channels, the U.S. military, the U.S. government has said to Iran, if you attack Israel, we will attack you. Foreign Minister Israel Katz from Israel said if Iran attacks from its territory, Israel responded and attack Iran. What are we on? From 1978, what's that? 10, 20, 30, 40, 46 years now since the Iranian revolution and the Ayatollahs took over? and just threw the Middle East into chaos, even more than it already was and has been since, has been threatening Israel since in Israel's existence. You know, it's a horrible thing to think, but if this has to be done, let it be done. If Iran attacks Israel, Iran is going to be crushed. Remember, President Biden is trying to sit on the fence between supporting Israel 
and assuring American Jews that he is supporting Israel or not supporting Israel and supporting Palestine, Hamas, Iran, for one simple reason, the Electoral College and the Arab Muslim vote in Michigan. Last week, President Biden was on the side of Hamas and the Palestinians in Iran. This week, he says he's firmly on the side of Israel. Someone has gotten to Joe Biden over the past seven days, for sure, because that's quite a change in rhetoric. And so Joe Biden is weighing the American Jewish vote against the American Arab Muslim vote. And C has been picking the side of the Arab Muslim vote. And again, Michigan is a very important electoral college state. First reports are always wrong on these types of things. There's no doubt that Iran must be readying itself for an attack on Israel because it won't let those attacks go unnoticed. It's more likely Iran attacks Israel or responds through its proxies in Yemen, through the Houthis, in Lebanon, through, the, through Hezbollah, in Gaza, through Hamas. So it's not clear. I hope Iran got the message. And if Iran dares to attack Israel directly from its own territory, Iran's going to get crushed. All right, the other thing that caught my attention in terms of news was Janet Yellen's visit to China. Even though China has made it very clear that they are a strategic foe and want to replace the United States as the number one superpower in the world, they want Taiwan back, they threaten the Philippines, they threaten Japan, and yet the Biden administration is doing all it can to mollify, to show China that we're their friends and everything's okay. We can You can keep exporting to us. We can keep wiping out our middle class. Remember, China is engaging in some serious asymmetrical warfare as it prepares to attack Taiwan sometime soon. And they're setting up a situation where they'll be able to uh, disrupt America internally with Chinese nationals here in the country tied to the Communist Party and the PLA to delay America's response once China decides to attack. This is pure game theory. And China has to make a decision to attack the U.S. before it attacks Taiwan to make its attack on Taiwan more successful or to attack Taiwan and deal with America's response. And it's very clear that China is sending forward troops into our own country using the southern border as a, as a venue. It's not just China, of course. Most of our adversaries have citizens in America that are probably waiting, right? We call them cells. Anyway, Janet Yellen, when she was concluding her time in China, had this to say. After wrapping up my meetings, I capped off a productive trip with a visit to the Imperial College and a microbrewery in Beijing that imports American hops for their beers. A small representation of how the U.S.-China bilateral economic relationship can benefit both sides. Think of the implications of such a statement. If that's the best we can hope for from our leaders, hops exported to China. This is reverse economic colonization. This is third world against the first world. Exporting unfinished products is the role of third world countries. Exporting finished goods with huge value added is the role of leadership countries. In America, since the late 1970s, has been turned into a third world exporter. We export raw materials and we import finished goods. And we have a $1.1 trillion trade deficit to prove it, a hollowed out middle class, a lack of expertise and know-how for hundreds and hundreds of different, differently produced goods. For the Treasury Secretary in China to praise our relationship with China because they import our hops. And again, agricultural exports are important. I understand. Agriculture is important. But this is not the, the, the position of a first world trading partner. No, we came to China long ago and now China holds the power in our trade relationship. What we have, of course, is reciprocity. We have tariffs. We have quotas. We have the U.S. dollar that can be devalued or depreciated to decrease the price of our exports and increase the price of their imports. China manipulates their currency daily to maintain essentially a peg against the U.S. dollar to maintain their labor cost advantage over us. Anyway, a little bit of an embarrassing piece there for Secretary Yellen. All right, let's check in on markets quickly on the back of the PPI data today. Not surprising, S&P 500 up 38 on a day after they got crushed, right, by the dip in equities, by the dip in equities. It's pathetic. This market has got to be taken down. It's a huge bubble. Anyway, S&P 500 up 38 today at 5,199 on the back of what they obviously perceiving as a PPI number not too threatening 
that leaves open the possibility the Fed will cut rates in June. That's what the stock market is saying today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down two. 10-year U.S. Treasury up another two basis points to 4.57%. Oil down small at $85.63 for WTI and the NYMEX. Nat gas trading at $1.76 down 11 cents. Gold up again. 2390 gold sees inflation, gold sees uncertainty, up $42 today. Taking out one technical level after another when it comes to gold. These are all record highs. Every time we have a new high, it's a new record high. Silver up 51 cents at $28.56. Dollar index 105.27. Huge rally from yesterday. We're trading 104 yesterday. Dollar yen 153.23. Holy cow, the BOJ has got to be furious. Took a lot of technical levels to the upside. Euro dollar 107.30. British pound 125.50. Dollar strength. God bless America. Happy days. Now, of course, a dollar, dollar strength is not what we want. We need dollar weakness. We run a serious trade deficit. So this is not helpful. And in terms of economic data today, beyond the PPI, as always, on every Thursday, we get the initial unemployment claims for the prior week. So we had the initial unemployment claims for the week ending April 6th. 211,000 of our fellow Americans lost their jobs and filed for initial unemployment claim insurance. That was better than expected and better than the prior month. This, this number is just silly now. This number is Fugazi. Fugazi, I tell you. Donnie Brasco, go watch the movie. Al Pacino, Fugazi. We were supposed to have the federal budget balance out for the month of March, but it's been taken off the calendar. All right, that's all I have for you today. Always try to buy American.